I'm going to derive time dilation for an object moving near the speed of light. Not near, but fast. Uh, and this all comes from Einstein's theory of special relativity. So imagine that you had a car. And this is the classic example, right? There's a car and it's driving with some velocity v, and it turns on its headlights. So the person inside the car sees the light traveling out of the car at c, where c is the speed of light. So remember, c is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. OK, got that. Now, what if there's another person over here and they look at that light? I mean, they can't look at the light, right, because you can't see from the side. But still, they, they somehow measure the speed of light. This observer measures the speed of light. They both observers, the car, which we'll call person A, and the person standing there, person B, they both see the speed of light as 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Even if this is going half the speed of light, the car is going half the speed of light, he doesn't see, he or she, does not see that light at 1.5 times the speed of light, they see it at the speed of light. Everyone sees the speed of light as the speed of light. Now, this is one of the key ideas in special relativity, that everyone sees the speed of light the same, no matter what their reference frame. But why did Einstein say that? Well, there's really two reasons, okay? The first is the Michelson-Morley experiment. So the idea is imagine that you have the sun, and you don't even have to imagine it, because we do, we have a sun. And then we have the Earth, and the Earth is orbiting the sun. So the Michelson-Morley experiment's goal was to measure the speed of light with respect to some background, uh, some medium that it travels through, the, the ether, they called it. And if you look at the Earth at, in December and then in June or July, it's moving in a complete opposite direction because it's orbiting the Sun. So based on the speed of the Earth here and the speed of the Earth there, if the speed of light was relative to your, uh, an absolute reference frame, you'd see a difference in speed. And, and there was no detected difference. And so how do you de measure the speed of light? How do you check and see if there's a difference? This is that famous... Um, interferometer experiment. So you take a laser, which they didn't have a laser, but that's fine, and the light comes out of there. It hits a beam splitter, which is just a piece of glass. Some of it goes up here to a mirror, and then it bounces back. And then some goes through to a mirror and bounces back, and then comes down here. So you have two beams of light that started from the same spot and took different paths. And so if the path length is different or the speed is different in one of those paths, then you'll detect an interference pattern there. And so they, they didn't find that. That was a key point for Einstein, is that the speed of light didn't change no matter what time of year, no matter what. Never changed. It can never find a difference. The other is this. From Maxwell's equations, if you have Maxwell's equations in, in an uh, empty space, there's no charges, then we have del cross E is negative the partial of B with respect to T with respect, that's not a derivative. So this is the electric field, and that's the magnetic field. And then you have del cross B is 1 over mu naught. No, it's not 1 over it's mu naught times. No, it is 1 over mu naught. 1 over mu naught epsilon naught partial of E with respect to T. OK, that, those are two of Maxwell's equations. From that, you can do a little magic, and you get the following. The partial, second partial of E with respect to t is 1 over mu naught epsilon naught and what is it del squared e that's right and and you don't have to worry about that okay the point is maxwell's equations say that we should get a wave from an electromagnetic field and the speed of that wave would be c is 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught Maxwell's equations say that. Now, the other main idea in physics is that if you have a uh, reference frame that's moving at a constant speed, your laws of physics should be the same no matter what, right? If I'm in an elevator moving at a constant speed, I can't really tell if I'm moving or the Earth's moving. I can't tell. So with those two things, since, the speed, since Maxwell's equations should work in a reference frame, then Maxwell's equations should give the same speed of light. So every reference frame should measure the speed of light as the same. Those are the two things. Okay. Now, how can we use that to calculate time dilation? Suppose I have here um, 
a clock. And it doesn't look like a clock, but it is. This clock has a mirror on the top and the bottom. And my clock then shoots a beam of light across that. And we, let's say this has a distance of, I'm going to call it S1. So I can say, well, that, how long would it take that beam to get across there? It's light. I'm in, I'm in here. I'm measuring my clock. So I can say uh, C is going to be S1 over delta T. I'm going to call that delta T1. And you'll see why. So delta T1 is going to be equal to S1 over C. So that's, how, that's the tick. That's my tick rate for reference frame 1. Now I have another person over here, and they are looking at the same clock. However, their clock is in a moving object, and it's moving with some velocity v that way. So this is still uh, a distance s1. But in their viewpoint, the light doesn't go up and come back down. It, just, it goes up and at an angle. So it goes like this. And so this is S1, but it travels that extra distance right there. Let's call this S2. So delta T2 is going to be S2 over C. They see it going the speed of light at C. Well, we can get a relationship for S2 based on that distance and that distance. So I can say it's a right triangle. So I can say S2 squared is S1 squared plus this extra distance. So how far did it move during that time? Well, I have delta T2. That's how long it took. And that is the velocity times delta T, right? So I can say the velocity is some delta X over delta T2. So uh, delta X is going to be V delta T. So this is going to be plus V squared times delta T2 squared. Where did I go from here? I always forget this step. I got that. OK, so now I can write, uh, what did I do? I always get this mixed up. And I was like, I'm going to make a video because I always get this wrong. And so I'm going to do it the right time. So S2 squared plus S1, right? and S1 is C delta T1. That's what I'm going to say. S1, no, it's C delta T2. No, S1, this distance, I can write, oh man, no, that's what I'm going to write. I can write this as uh, the speed of light, right, times delta T2. That's what I'm going to write. Okay, got it now. Got it, back on track. So I have uh, C squared delta T squared uh, equals... S1 squared, which is the length of that, we'll just leave it like that for now, plus V, that's not V2, that's just V squared delta T2 squared. Now I want to solve that for delta T. So I'm going to subtract this from both sides, and I'm going to erase stuff because I ran out of room. I poorly managed my space here. So if I do that, I get S1 squared is going to be C squared delta t2 squared minus v squared delta t2 squared. Now I can factor out the delta t and I get s1 squared is going to be c squared minus v squared times delta t2 squared. So delta t2 squared is going to be s1 squared over c minus v squared. Now I can take the square root. Okay. But before I do that, I want to get s1 in terms of delta t1 up here. So I can say S1 squared is C squared delta T1 squared. So let's do that. So delta T2 squared is going to be C squared times delta T1 squared over C squared minus V squared. OK, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So I get delta T2 is C delta T1 over the square root of c squared minus v squared. Now, I have a c on the bottom and the top. I'm going to factor out a c, so I can do that. I can write this as c delta t1 
over c times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, right? Because if I factor that out, I have to get a c out of there, but I don't have one there, so I just divide by it anyway, and those cancel. So there we have it. We have time dilation. Let's look at this equation. So this says delta t2 is delta t1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. This apparent time in the moving frame, that's from the stationary person looking at the moving frame, that's the person in the moving frame's time, delta t1, it decreases with velocity. So as velocity increases, this gets longer. If, if it couldn't happen, but if v was c, I'd have 1 minus 1 over 0, so I'd have an infinite time scale, right? That's the time for one tick. So this is your time dilation equation. We did it. Okay, not the best, but we did it. Um, now, one of the important things to remember is that if I have this person, we'll call that A, person A in moving with a velocity V, and then I have person B over here stationary. So B sees A, the time going slower. But A's frame is moving at a constant speed. So from their perspective, B is moving back that way at the velocity V. So A sees person B's time moving slower. So they both see the other person's time slower. And you can only compare if someone had to come back and have the clocks next to each other. But in that case, you'd have to have an acceleration. And so acceleration is not part of special relativity. Special relativity is just moving at a constant velocity. There you go. Hope that helps. A little bit of algebra. It's not that hard to derive. The end.